Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for an overview and demonstration of Homegrown Tools, a new tool developed by one of EDA's university centers, UNC Chapel Hill and C Growth. My name is Bernadette Grafton. I'm with the U.S. Economic Development Administration, and I'm the University Center Coordinator in our national headquarters office in Washington, D.C. We currently have 63 university centers across the nation funded by EDA and managed out of our regional offices. NC Growth is in our Atlanta regional office, and they're in their second year of funding in a five-year funding cycle. I'm excited to introduce you to the team that developed and continues to improve this tool. The goal is that your feedback from this webinar will help to continuously um, strengthen and improve the, the resources that they're providing to communities. And so um, this will be a very interactive webinar uh, with plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. Today you'll hear from, from the team some of the history of the tool and how it's intended to work, who it's intended to serve, and then we'll see a brief demonstration of the tool itself. We'll also be hearing from a couple of communities how they have found this tool to be useful um, so you can get a sense of, of the, the audience that it's working for um, including a local government perspective and a financial institution perspective. And then at the end, we'll hear about the next steps kind of where this tool is going, uh, followed by substantial time at the end for Q&A. Um, we will hear from Mark Little at NC Growth first, um, and then Carolyn Freiberger. Um, and I will turn it over to them now so they can um, describe to you this great tool that's been developed. Thank you all for joining, and we will, um, we will continue this conversation as we go through the day. Uh, we've had the um, uh, great fortune of being able to partner with some other folks here at UNC, um, with the Federal Reserve, uh, to develop a new tool um, that I think will be very useful for us in the work that we do, but part of the reason for this webinar is we think that it'll be very useful for, uh, for folks across um, the United States. Um, so we're really just gonna jump into it, into this. Um, uh, Carolyn is gonna tell you more about the tool. Um, and then at the end, um, we'll have uh, some more time for questions and answers. I do just wanna put one uh, little plug in there. Um, in addition to our primary goal of sharing this tool with folks so that they start using it and learn about it, um, this really is also an opportunity for partnering and collaboration um, across organizations and communities really across the U.S. And we'll talk a little bit more at the end about how, how we might uh, work on that moving forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thanks, Mark, for that introduction. My name is Carolyn Freiberger. I'm the Economic Development Manager with NC Growth. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And I am going to jump right into a, a demonstration here of the, the web tools. I'm just going to share our screen. Um, and we'll go from there. So the first off, um, the URL to access the web tool is just homegrowntools.unc.edu. Um, as Mark mentioned, we had a lot of partners on this project, and I will go ahead and name some of those. Um, so the UNC School of Government, the Department of City and Regional Planning here at Carolina, um, the North Carolina Rural Center, of course, um, EDA, the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond and the Keenan Institute, um, which is where NC Growth is housed. Um, so on this site, you'll see there's there's three different um, primary ways to really engage with the material, and our hope is that this will help people sort of get into the material, and then once you're more familiar with the site, there's a lot of different ways you can navigate it after that. Um, you also have just a little bit about, about the tool here for those that are new, and then we highlight featured case studies in this portion of the homepage, um, particularly as we update the content and add new case studies, they'll be highlighted here on the front page um, so that people are directed straight to that content. So in thinking about um, the audience for this tool and how it might be used, you know, one of the, the things that came up as we were, as we work in communities is often um, working with communities that don't have a lot of economic development capacity within their staff. Um, it might just be, you know, a mayor and a town manager. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have a planning department or an economic development 
position. And so we wanted this information to be accessible to folks that aren't necessarily in the jargon of economic development every day. Um, and to that end, this first um, kind of way into the case studies, this customized results tab, allows someone to take a quick little survey about their community um, that will then help pull case studies similar to them. Um, so we'll just do a quick uh, demonstration here. We'll say we're from a small town that has cultural assets and natural beauty or recreational assets. So this question is asking what's the community's biggest strength? You can choose up to three. Um, the next question really focuses on what outcomes you're looking for. So perhaps building up stronger small businesses or recovering from the loss of a major employer, um, which are issues that we see in a lot of our small towns and rural places. And then finally, we just ask, what is your role? Um, and this is more for our purposes to just understand who's using the tool and how we might better um, reach that audience into the future as we continue to, to develop new material for, for the tool. So once you hit submit, you'll get a list of cases that are um, most relevant to, to the town. And as you can see, you have a quick snapshot of, of what that town did and the background on, on the town. Um, but then we also have these tags relating to the strategies that they've pursued um, so that, again, if there's a specific thread that you're really interested in, be it entrepreneurship or downtown revitalization, um, you can just click on that tab and it'll take you to all the cases that are um, tagged with that strategy. So to jump into a specific one and really see, you know, this is really the meat of, of the tool, are these case studies. Um, each town has a page like this that'll give you a quick synopsis of the back background on that town, what strategies they're pursuing. Again, those tags, um, quick snapshot of the census data so you can kind of compare in terms of the town size, median income, um, proximity to a major urban center. Again, how similar is this to my community? Um, it will help you gauge that. And then you will see at the bottom here are really the key lessons learned from the case study material. So each town has a, a full case study written up that's between about three and seven pages in length. Um, but this page just gives you the quick snapshot of what are the lessons learned, what can I take home to my community, even if we have a very different um, economic landscape. So, you know, finding creative re uses for vacant buildings, for example, something that can be applied in a lot of different communities um, with different struggles. But then the, here in the center, we have this button that will take us to that full case study, um, and you can view really in depth, what did the town do? How did they go about it? Why is this strategy working? And then who can I reach out to for more information? Um, each case has, has contact information listed with it. And the, a lot of the, this body of work was originally written um, in 2008, and we are now updating it. And so I'm gonna pull up a case study that has an update, and you will hear more about this community in, in just a minute. This is Hillsborough, North Carolina. Um, here you'll see in that center, we've got the, original, the complete original case study here, and then there's an update from 2017. So this allows you to see, is that community still doing, pursuing that same strategy that they were pursuing 10 years ago? Um, if not, how has it changed? What kind of strategies are they pursuing instead? Um, and in either case, kind of what are the outcomes that they've seen? Are there you know, some metrics that they've been tracking to show their, their progress on these different strategies. And then again, we have the updated um, contact information here for each of the cases. So this tool, um, it really is a, a work in progress. We are, um, we've built it out with a, let me show you the map here and you can see just the complete uh, coverage that we have at this point. So we do have cases from all across the country. Um, we are working to build that out with stories of new communities that aren't covered here. And then for each community that's pinned on this map, um, we are reaching out to them and finding out what has happened since that first case study was written in 2008 and updating that information on this site 
Um, we've got a lot of content waiting in the wings that we're going to be pushing out this summer, and so we will be sending that out to, to you all um, as participants in this webinar and other partners to let you know when there's new information to engage with um, on the site. And then just to sort of round out the tour here, I'm going to go back to the home page. So we visited the customized results survey. Um, we visited this explore towns to see the map. And then you can also just browse by strategy type. And this is a synopsis of all the different strategies that are currently represented. Um, and again, as we build out with new content, this, the strategies represented will also develop. Um, so you can see here all of the different strategies currently represented. And then you can click on a specific one of interest and find a case that, that speaks um, to that specific strategy. Um, so, I'm going to wrap up the, the tour of the site there, um, and we're really excited to have with us um, in the studio, as it were, <laughs> Shannon Campbell, um, who is the Economic Development Planner for Hillsboro, North Carolina, and um, I've asked her to just speak a bit to kind of Hillsboro's economic development story. Um, <laughs> and kind of what it's meant to the community to be included in this web tool and how they've been able to use it um, since its launch. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, yeah, I'm Shannon Campbell, Economic Development Planner for Hillsboro, North Carolina. Um, visit hillsboronc.com if you're interested in learning more about us. Um, our main economic development strategy um, started in the early 90s. Uh, Hillsboro is a very progressive, forward-thinking community and um, they decided to leverage tourism. Um, there were one of the oldest towns in North Carolina. We have a lot of history. Um, so they, they really went with a heritage tourism perspective. Um, they did decide to levy a food and beverage tax, sometimes called a meals tax, which is fairly um, uncommon for municipalities in North Carolina. My understanding is that it's very popular in Virginia, though. So um, those in Virginia, in Virginia may have, have more um, familiarity with it. Um, they also decided to take their 3% of Orange County's um, maximum 6% occupancy tax from hotel, motel, lodging stays. Mm -hmm. So that has grown over time um, with the growth of tourism. Um, you know, in 2000, from 2008 to 2017, it was really interesting to sit back down with someone um, from UNC and kind of look at what they were doing in 2008, because I obviously wasn't with the town in 2008. Um, the town did not grow large enough to have an economic development position until 2015. Um, so that's kind of when we started tracking everything and, and doing our metrics and figuring out kind of more fine-tuning what works and what doesn't for tourism. So it was good to, to look back at 2008 and, and look at what we're doing now and, and what well, tourism really worked for Hillsboro. And so what we've done is expanded on that exponentially. Um, we were only focused on history and heritage tourism. We've expanded that to um, outdoor recreation. We've got a really heavy focus on arts and live music. And we are also um, highlighting our food and beverage scene. So we've got, you know, bars and restaurants making craft cocktails. We've got James Beard award-winning chefs. You know, there's more to Hillsborough than just history, but that's definitely kind of what we hang our hat on. Um, and then when the town hired an economic development position in 2015, we also started doing traditional economic development, which is business recruitment, retention, and expansion. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been really excited to be a part of this. Uh, I know I use the tool even now. I, I love the tool. I'm in there all the time kind of looking around um, when someone makes a suggestion. For example, we've been looking at uh, facade grants some public-private partnership opportunities, and um, also how to better foster our, our, our maker class and our entrepreneurs in our community. So it's really, it's nice for me to be able to go into the tool, you know, rather than having to Google and then find a community that's doing what I think that I want to do and then call them and then wait for them to call me back because in a small town, everyone's really swamped. We all wear lots of hats. So it's nice to be able to go into the tool, see easily see what everybody else is doing, kind of what worked, what didn't. Um, another thing we're looking at is like a mural in downtown, you know, for a historic downtown that may be a little jarring, but have has anybody else done it and seen a really positive result? So we really enjoy using the tool, and and I, you know, I encourage. I, it's nice to go in and kind of click around, and you you learn it very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's very intuitive in that way. Yeah, and one 
um, other feature that, you know, up at the top right, there's a little search bar. So if you have something specific in mind, like a facade grant, you could just plug that straight into that, that search feature and see what other communities might come up. I know another one I've used is um, mill redevelopment comes up a lot in North Carolina. There's a lot of communities that have that have vacant mill buildings. Um, we have several communities that feature a redevelopment of a mill, but it's not a specific strategy that's tagged, um, but you can get still get to them that way. So yeah, it's probably hard to of, tag all the strategies. Right. Because I mean, even on our page, it's like, well, yeah, we are doing these, we are doing some other things, but mm -hmm. hitting the tags is, is really hard, especially when um, some of us in small towns are trying anything that might work. <laughs> so anything that we think might get us some positive results, we're, we're moving forward with. But, but yeah, we've, we've, we've been happy to, to be a part of it. And, um, you know, as far as tourism goes and, and our economic, overall economic development strategy, um, you know, seeing what other people are doing, it, even in the tourism realm, has been nice to see how others are leveraging their greenways and um, other maps to see trail communities like we are, kind of see what they're doing, and I'll get us one. So mm -hmm. it's just been, it's been really good. Great. Thank you. Um, and Bernadette, I'm going to pause for a second and see if you have seen Brent Fraser join us and if he might be able to, to speak to the group as well. I have not. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we were hoping to have the mayor of Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, um, join us today as well. Um, and maybe he'll pop on later in the call, so maybe we can still come back to that. Um, but barring that, um, we've also got Jonathan Morgan with us. He is a professor over at the UNC School of Government. And Jonathan, I'm going to pull you up so that you're spotlighted here and would love to have you um, speak about the way that you see the tool being useful and kind of the, the perspective of the local government community broadly. Sure, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, can you all hear me okay? We were having some audio, we're good. Um, yeah, we're just delighted at the School of Government to see the tool being revived. Um, the school was involved early on with the original case studies, uh, working with the North Carolina Rural Center to do the original batch, and um, they were great at the time, and we, we got a lot of usage out of those original case studies, integrating them into our teaching and our advising with public officials across North Carolina. Um, but time moves pretty quickly, and the concern uh, with doing case studies that are fixed at a place in time is that uh, they, can, they can get dated. The shelf life um, is, is not forever, and so, the opportunity with homegrown tools to be able to revisit these case studies uh, and update many of them, which that process is already underway, uh, and to also be able to add to the, the original set uh, with new ones, I think is just a tremendous opportunity. In my work across North Carolina, working with local governments and public officials, one of the most common questions I get is, uh, professor, tell me what others are doing in with regard to this strategy or in terms of using this particular tool, whether it's facade grants, as you mentioned, Shannon, or uh, tax increment financing, uh, downtown revitalization more generally. And um, it's nice to be able to have a, a vetted set of case studies as a resource to be able to point public officials toward uh, so that they can learn more and and dig deeper. And I think the vetting process that we, are, we use with these uh, case studies is what adds a lot of the value uh, with this particular tool so that, uh, Shannon, as you said, you, you're, you're not having to just dig around on Google uh, with hits and misses in terms of what you might see that is promising. You have this body of work that's been vetted um, that is now being updated, and so uh, that's pretty exciting. And so I think the, the local governments that I work with uh, say that they use the tool just to get a sense of what other communities are doing and uh, to begin to get some sense of what, what could potentially work in their own communities. And so um, I, I'm excited about it and um, I've been using the tool recently and the updates I think are, are just tremendous in terms of comparing sort of where the community was in 06, 08 when we first started the project to where they're, what they're doing now. And in some instances, they're sort of continuing along a similar path and trajectory. And in other instances, um, 
they they have shifted course a bit. And so it's it's useful to be able to learn in both of those cases sort of what what how things have evolved since we did the original set of case studies. Great. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that perspective. Um, I, and I think one of the things you said that I really want to highlight as well that you know, in some cases, people are continuing with the same strategy. Um, and in some cases, when we, we go back for updates, we also find out that uh, nothing much has changed, nothing much has happened. And I think that that's still useful information for other communities to learn from. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard as we've showed the tool around is um, the question has been, well, what about failures? What about things that didn't work? And right. having the opportunity to check back in um, allows us to gather that kind of information uh, without, you know, putting someone's laundry out to dry or something like that, but um, it, it allows us to see, okay, this, this strategy didn't take off in the way that we thought it would, and so we pivoted and we're doing this instead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, well, Jeannie Bonds is with us from the Richmond Federal Reserve, um, also here in, in person, so <laughs> I'll pass it over to her to, to speak about um, perspective from community development. Okay, great, thanks. So I um, would first say that many people watching this webinar may think of the Federal Reserve only as a monetary policy institution, um, but all 12 reserve banks across the country, as well as the Board of Governors, actually have a microeconomic function that looks at regional uh, data and conditions, and then we also have a community development function. And the community development function comes from our being a regulator along with the FDIC and the OCC, which is in Treasury, for the Community Reinvestment Act. So that was passed in 1977, and it's our job to work with bankers, work with communities, teach them about the CRA as a source of financing projects. So from our perspective, I'll also just add that um, anyone on the webinar can go to fedcommunities.org, and you can find your reserve bank. You can also find a lot of information that we put out, um, which would uh, be complementary to this, and you can find videos on the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, but for us, for a financial institution, I've used this tool when I'm working with bankers on teaching them some specific aspect of the CRA, because what a banker needs to do is a bank develops a strategy around the Community Reinvestment Act, and then they have to find um, partners uh, that they're going to work with in order to provide access to those low and moderate income communities. So they need data, they need examples. Um, a bank may have a specific plan um, for an activity, and this is a great tool for them to be able to go in and look for communities that are doing something that fits with that bank strategy. Also, a bank uh, as part of the CRA, they have to build performance context, which I kind of explain the storytelling, so it's the story of the bank, what the bank wants to do to extend that credit and provide access, and it's also the story of a community. Um, so they have to talk about the community, what they need, reach out to partners. This is a great tool for a financial institution to take a look at communities that might be in their assessment area under CRA see what they're doing, learn some data, and I think it uh, could potentially be a matchmaking, which I hope we would be able to capture in this at some point, a matchmaking tool where a financial institution is looking for something, they go on homegrown tools, they find the community, it fits with their strategy, it fits with CRA, and we have some new financing that occurs because of the tool. So we, I'm sharing it with my colleagues across the country, and we're starting to use it in the training sessions, both on the community side as well as on the um, banking side um, in order to make that connection. So again, our hopes would be that as the content's expanded, as the information's expanded, um, we could add a little bit um, more texture to some of the um, write-ups by adding some of the financing that takes place and actually highlight some projects where a community um, was able to do something more or something as part of their plan through the Community Reinvestment Act. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, we're and we're very excited about you know expanding this and deepening the information as as we go along and really get a sense of how people are using it. So I love to hear these different examples of how different um, users interact with the tool. Um, 
And to that end, we are, we're also collecting some user information on the back end, so capturing what kind of search terms are being used and capturing that data from the, um, the survey tool itself on the site, which is really gonna, we hope, allow us to understand more about economic development trends in specific regions and over time seeing kind of the change in language of how people descri describe um, the strategies they're looking for um, and also just the, you know, what, what types of issues are coming up in specific communities by region or by size. Um, so that's data that, that we will be generating um, as the tool continues to roll out and we're excited to have as a research tool um, moving forward as well. Um, in terms of other next steps, as Mark mentioned at the top of the call, and I'm gonna pull my slides back up here so that you can see some uh, contact information. Um, so, this is, I just have to show this photo because, um, and also, I'll also pause in case Brent has joined us. Bernadette, do you know if Brent has? I'm sorry, I, think, I know that there's 39 phone call in listeners, but I don't see names associated with that. So okay. I, and there's no phone number listed, so I'm so sorry. Okay, <laughs> I was just gonna check. Um, but here is this lovely community. As you can see, there is a Pelican and a Rapid in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota. Um, so just felt that need to be, needed to be shared if you couldn't be with us today. Um, this community is, is featured in the tool for um, having programming, particularly around helping immigrants become entrepreneurs in their downtown. Um, so I encourage you to go check that one out. We do have an update on that one that will be posted this summer. So go ahead and um, read the original study and, and then look for more information soon. And I know Brent would be um, happy to chat with folks that are interested to hear more about his town story. So next steps, as we've alluded to many times, we're continuing to build this out with, with new content and with updated content. Um, with the new content in particular, uh, we really can't do that without expanded partnerships on the tool. Um, you know, we're based in North Carolina and we have a great footprint of, of case studies in our region. And we're really excited to connect with um, other university centers and other entities that whose mission might align with this. Um, to develop new case study content. Um, we're gonna be developing kind of a partnership packet this summer that we'll be able to send you that has a template for the case study write up um, and some guidelines around that so that uh, you know if you know of a community in your region um, or in your studies, um, you could write that up and send it over to us, we can feature it on the tool um, and feature you as a partner in that effort as well. Um, so we'd love to you know, highlight the work that you're already doing. Um, and as Shannon really highlighted for Hillsborough, the being in the tool can actually be an asset to a community in and of itself, um, as well as adding to the body of knowledge that, that we all have to, to access for these kinds of efforts. Um, and then with that, of course, we would love if you promoted this through your networks and um, spread the word to other communities uh, that this resource is out here. And again, if any of those communities are interested in being featured, um, they can reach out to me. So my contact information is there on the slide. Um, and with that, that's um, where, we, yeah, we'll pause here. And so we can take questions. I know Bernadette has been collecting questions from the group all along. Um, so I'll just pause and, and let you queue those up. Great. So I think some of these questions may have already been answered, so we may fly through these pretty quickly. Okay. Um, the first question is, does the census data include the U.S. Virgin Islands? Good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there are no communities in the U.S. Virgin Islands that are featured on the tool. Is that a question about census data broadly? I don't know the answer to that question. Jonathan, do you I don't know? Either. <laughs> I, 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 do. I don't, I'm not, no, I don't We can know. get back to uh, this okay. person on that. Sounds <laughs> like a, a question for the U.S. Census. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, Kevin Peterson asked, are you looking for additional case studies from other communities? And I believe you've answered that. Yes. <laughs> yes, we absolutely are. We would love to chat if Kevin has some communities um, that he thinks might be a good fit. Great. Um, Larry Burkhart asked, how were the case study communities selected? There's a lot of flyover country that isn't represented. 
Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And I think we will largely be working, as I mentioned, through partnerships. Um, and so relying on regional partners to help us identify where the, the interesting stories are um, and the potential successful communities are. And so that's an area where we would love to develop more partnerships to develop out more content uh, for that region. Great. Um, let's see, Joan Simonetti asked, can attendees of this webinar have access to the site, complete the survey, and see what communities would be comparable? Yeah, so I'll just name again, I should have put it on this final slide, um, but the the URL for the site, um, I will just navigate back up to that slide so you can all see it. Um, URL is homegrowntools.unc.edu, um, so you should all be able to access that and um, you can select that customized results option on the front page um, right here on the left side of the page, and that will allow you to, to take that survey to find what case studies might be most relevant to your community. Great. Um, has, let's see, Kevin Peterson asked that, he said, I suspect there may be a big difference between pre and post Great Recession case studies. Is there a way besides looking at the date range on the case study to differentiate between pre and post recession? Mm -hmm. So for now, it is the date range. Um, we have, as we, continue to tweak some things, there's some other tags that we're planning to add in, and that may be a useful tag uh, that we could add in the future, just sort of a cutoff for um, timeline. But again, there will be those updates posted on all communities, so even for community where we have kind of pre-recession initial information, we'll be following that up with the current day to get a sense of, of what happened um, after. Great. There have actually been a couple of questions about the slides being made available later. Yes, mm -hmm. we, we will make this available later and um, the, there is also a recording. So assuming that the recording is, uh, was done successfully, then we will make that available um, definitely on EDA's website, but I'm sure we'll, it'll be in multiple places. So stay tuned for that. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Might small cities in the urban Northeast be of interest to add cases into the tool? We are such a community, Fitchburg, Massachusetts. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we would love to hear from you, Pittsburgh, Massachusetts. <laughs> All right. Um, is EDD designation or university center designation a requirement for providing potential case studies or becoming a partner? No, definitely not. <laughs> No, yeah. Answer we, that one any, real quick. <laughs> yeah. If, if, yeah, there's mission alignment with any organization um, that's interested in writing up cases to put into the tool. We, we are definitely interested in that. All right, let's see. I'm checking the other chat box to see if there's any other questions that came in. Uh, and uh, Bernadette, this is Jeannie, so I, I thought I needed to answer and I wanted to verify it that the Virgin Islands are, all of our territories are included in the census. Um, so that question about Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, any of those, um, we do collect census data. And I think it's also a good time just to remind people that we have another census coming mm -hmm. and how important that um, census is, not only to homegrown tools, but just generally in terms of um, how local governments uh, acquire financial asset. Mm -hmm. That's great a great point. point. Thank uh, there you. There was a question from that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, there was Go a right question ahead, from right earlier ahead. about who prepares the stories and what is the criteria? Mm -hmm. That made so, Yeah, so it can happen in a number of different ways. Um, the ideal would be that you have a community in mind and are able to either write that up or work with, for example, um, university students, graduate students in, in your area. So one of the partnerships that's been really successful for us is working with um, the Department of City and Regional Planning here at UNC, which has an economic development policy um, graduate level course where they're required to write up case studies about economic development. Um, so that's a natural fit for, for writing up the case studies. Um, so, you know, that's one way that it can happen, um, and I think that that is, has the most potential to expand the content uh, the fastest. <laughs> um, and in terms of specific criteria, I think at this point we're really interested in having a, 
really a diversity of towns represented in terms of size, geographic location, challenges that they're facing, assets that they have. Um, so I wouldn't say that we have strict criteria in that regard. Um, there will be criteria in terms of how the case study is actually written. There's kind of a template of the different sections that would need to be addressed. And we do have a sort of an editorial review board um, that will help to review new content and make sure that it's, it's up in terms of quality, it's at a, a standard um, to be included in the in the site. But again, if a case is largely written up, we could work with you on that to make sure that that it meets that standard. Hmm. Okay. Um, another question came in just now. Are you interested in successful communities, ones which have seen demonstrated results, or are you interested in the in-process approaches where results have yet to be demonstrated, but the approach is novel or unique? I think we'd be most interested in successful communities where there's a demonstrated result um, so that the the story is kind of complete of like here here was the problem here's what we did and here's you know we can see an impact or not an impact um, yeah that's what I would say and Jonathan I also want to pause at, I think some of these questions you might have input on as well if you wanted to add anything to that question in terms of value to communities of having an in-process case versus a more of an established case? Yeah, I know, I think it's a great question. And I think that uh, in reality, many of the case studies are, are they're, it's, it's both. Uh, right. So many case studies, uh, they sort of saw things through to at least an initial endpoint where they had some immediate results. And others, what was instructive about the case study was the process itself about how they brought folks together um, and decided to to move forward. And so I think it, it can be instructive even if there aren't like the, the final results and outcomes, if they haven't been achieved, even if you have, you know, we can learn something from the process and if you can show that the community was able to at least generate some some initial sort of wins, um, I think that that is, is helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just, a great just point. To chime in on that a little bit, um, you know, Hillsboro, I wouldn't say Hillsboro is a great uh, revitalization, you know, rags to riches kind of story. Um, what the big takeaway for me with the Hillsboro's growth and change was really, um, like Jonathan said about it, our wins are more stakeholder working together, partnering with our historic sites and with our small business community. Um, you know, Hillsboro has never really been economically depressed per se, um, but we were kind of flat for a long time. And we have seen kind of president, unprecedented growth and, and really a lot of vibrancy added to our downtown, but our downtown was never not vibrant. It just mm -hmm. wasn't quite what it could have been. So I think it's good to kind of get across the board some different because your wins aren't always economic growth or urban yeah. business development. Sometimes they are just actually getting everybody to come sit at the table and talk about right. what are our goals, where do we want to be, and how do we get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's also it's also a recognition that some of this is a long term proposition, um, and you know we can learn a lot from just how communities come together and and get everyone focused on trying to move the needle on 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 something and. That's the beauty of the updates that we're doing is that many of these communities, when they started, you know, back in 2006, 7, 8, trying to do some stuff, we now can check back 10 years later and see how, how things have played out. So um, I think, I think, you know, but it's also nice to have some that did actually achieve some, some tangible results in the mix as well. All right, so we have a few more questions. <laughs> they keep coming in, so we'll, we'll see how many we can cover. Uh, from a Federal Reserve perspective, are there simple ways to determine which banks have assessment areas in a given geography, like a county? Um, yes, yeah, so there's not extremely simple ways <laughs> to uh, determine that because banking has changed so dramatically and we have a lot of uh, national banks but I guess the the basic rule of thumb from the regulations is if there is a branch um, located in that area or a deposit taking um, automatic teller machine um, then th that financial institution has deposits in that area, and so they're going to be um, using that area as, the, in, as an assessment area under CRA. So that's kind of the simple rule. It gets a little more complicated, um, but what I would say is 
um, go to fedcommunities.org, look up which reserve bank you're in, and then contact someone like me, and um, we can help you figure that out um, for your specific area. Great, thanks. Um, just as a, a reminder to folks on the line who may not have been there for the very beginning of the webinar, can you just introduce yourselves, just name and position again? There were questions earlier about who's on the panel. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, I'm Carolyn Freiberger, Economic Development Manager for NC Growth. Mark Little, Director of NC Growth and Managing Director of the Keene Institute of Private Enterprise. Jeannie Milliken Bonds with the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. I'm Shannon Campbell, Economic Development Planner for the Town of Hillsboro, North Carolina. I'm Jonathan Morgan. I'm on the faculty at the UNC School of Government. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, another question is regarding rural uh, rural depopulation. So rural de depopulation is a major concern here in Vermont. Will population growth become an outcome you would like to see on the customized results tool, or is that already embedded in other outcomes? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think that's one we could definitely consider adding, um, though I think it also gets captured in some of the other outcomes. Population growth kind of drives some of the other outcomes that, that are listed there, um, but it's certainly one we could consider adding as an explicit um, outcome. It, maybe just to, to follow up on that, the idea of, of adding uh, different tags. Um, I was looking at the chat box and someone earlier mentioned things about brownfield redevelopment. Mm -hmm. And so we, for example, don't have any tools, I think, I don't that are think. around brownfield development. Mm -hmm. um, but we would we would love to to feature some of those and um, similarly that could be one of these tags or avenues into exploring. Um, so don't when you're looking at the tool, if you see some area uh, ge in terms of geography or topic that's not currently in there. It's not because we don't want it. Mm -hmm. It's just because we haven't developed that yet. And so th those would just be areas we'd want to get build new out. new case studies and build out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was another question earlier about the potential of case studies of failures that we can learn from and what your mm -hmm. thoughts on that are. Yeah, um, so this is something that's come up as we've kind of shown the tool around and gotten some initial feedback from folks. And I think that the way we'll really be able to get at, at failures is through the update process. So as we connect um, back to communities that are featured, um, learning from the kind of path that they took they're not still pursuing the strategy that they started out pursuing and instead they're pursuing something else. Um, I think that's where we'll really have the chance to, to learn for, from failures, but we have maintained the framing kind of a, as a, a success framing. So focusing on your assets, focusing on, on what is producing results, um, but then we will get to hear about those failures in terms of the, the case study updates and looking back on where they've come. And just to, to add on to that, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we came to this from, from our perspective and reached out to school government because of our experience working with small communities across North Carolina and many small communities we worked with know all about failure. And so we were really interested in positioning this as what have communities that are like you have done that's been successful. And so, you know, to, to Carolyn's point, the framing really is about success and realistic success, things mm -hmm. that have actually happened in places like you. And so we, we want to keep that spirit um, mm -hmm. in the tool as we build it out. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's see, we've got a question that I missed earlier uh, regarding uh, the potential of collaborating with US EPA environmental finance centers located in universities across the country. Is that? that Yes. Seems interesting. Yes. yes. <laughs> we are. We are. We have one of those at the School of Government. There we go. <laughs> um, all right. One that just came in. I work for a nonprofit organization that facilitates university industry collaboration. Are there any metrics that have to do with town, um, town grown relations or co-locating? Mm. Hmm. Town gown. Um, Town gown. So there, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So there are some communities that are um, featured that have colleges located within them. So there are some some case studies that speak to that town gown relationship and kind of the anchor institution 
um, potential for economic development there. Um, and, and we have a project of our own yes. that we need to get in the tool, um, <laughs> a project we worked with UNC Pembroke on um, that would be a nice fit for that. So, mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely an area that we can, we'd like to get some yeah. case studies around. And it's not currently one of the, um, the, the tagged strategies. If you go to browse strategies, you won't see like university partnerships, um, but it's something you could search for in that upper search box, search for university or college. Um, I, this has come up before and I had one other thought for you on that. Um, yeah, the one, it's also uh, useful to uh, recognize that um, with the university community connection piece that there are a couple of other organizations nationally that are compiling best practices. Uh, the University Economic Development Association is one. And um, so there are, you know, there may be a potential opportunity to sort of do some cross uh, pollination, uh, but they, they are compil actively compiling case studies that highlight the connections between universities and, and communities and economic development. Great. And that's also actually um, one kind of town feature that we have tracked for the the towns that are currently in the case study tool is kind of whether or not they have a university presence or other large anchor institution like a hospital. Um, and that's a tag that we could add going into the future as well uh, that may be of, of use for folks. Great. Uh, there was a follow-up statement uh, just regarding UNC Capitol Hill being one of their member organizations, and they can explore case studies in terms of town-gown relationships. So. Great. Yes. Um, and there was actually a submission of a potential case study to look at that's in the chat box. Oh, you guys oh, can wonderful. take a look at that. Cool. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of suggestions that I'm seeing. That, um, I would call that a success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there was uh, another follow-up question for the, uh, the Federal Reserve rep on the panel. Um, what do you suggest to unbanked and underbanked communities who want to access CRA partnerships? Um, well, um, I don't know if I quite understand that question. <laughs> I don't um, know either. Um, I don't know if they're saying, you know, would they acquire tools that would help them with being unbanked? I'm not quite sure where they're going with that. Maybe a, a community that doesn't have an ATM or doesn't have uh, a branch. As to um, CRA, yeah. okay. um, instead of homegrown tools. Um, yeah, so um, I would say the FDIC specifically focuses a lot. They actually do a lot of data collecting about unbanked communities um, because they're, they're also the insurers um, for those accounts. Um, so that's, that's really one of their mainstays that they take a look at that. Um, communities that may not have a deposit taking ATM and we have some in North Carolina or they may not have a branch, they can still be banked customers. Their branch may be a little um, further away. And so the issue um, now, especially in these rural areas, is so much is done electronically um, that you can still do your banking um, electronically, and if your money is not in your local community, um, yet a lot of times those communities don't have access to broadband, um, and they would fall outside um, a specific assessment area. But the way CRA works is that banks usually take kind of large swaths of areas and regional approaches, so I couldn't say specifically like which of those communities might be excluded in CRA. Um, so I wouldn't want to not be hopeful to those types of communities because they should team up as they should in anything regarding economic development with a region and be part of a region um, aspect. They can also get lending services through community development financial institutions. Um, which lend to the most underserved areas, and banks typically team up with those CDFIs and provide them with the capital to then do the lending in those areas. We also have credit unions um, that offer services in those areas. We have community development credit unions um, that team up in that process as well. So there's other options for them to be a participant and receive some of the benefit of the access of credit through CRA. Awesome. That that from the chat, it sounds like that was what they were looking for. Right. <laughs> uh, 
Um, let's see, there's a few suggestions. Uh, another question is when looking at a TIF funded economic development, the tool does not seem to have much there. Are there case studies under a different category that can address financing for development in areas not based on flight? Hmm. Um, so I'd say this is another area where the the lack of case studies isn't based mm -hmm. on lack of interest, but rather right. just uh, the tags reflect and the strategies reflect what we have currently in the tool. And so tip, developing out some case studies around TIF financing, I think, would be really valuable. Um, there are some other strategies, though, that in the tool currently that talk about um, redevelopment and, and financing um, probably within the downtown revitalization strategy would be one place to look. And then there's also some, there's specifically some under, um, what is, I think it's, there's a development tag. It might be uh, residential development, but um, let's see, I can pull up the tool again and just quickly look at that. And I'll just say um, one of the, so we have several North Carolina case studies in the tool in the uh, tool because the original funder was the North Carolina Rural Center and they had a strong interest in ensuring that we had a good number of North Carolina communities uh, in included. And the reality is that TIF in North Carolina is just not very widely used. We mm -hmm. did not even get it uh, in place until 2004, and so it just hasn't there hasn't been a significant uptake in the use of that tool. So that that reflects some of why we don't see many TIF. Uh, references in the case studies. And, yeah. and I'll add that I've been remiss. I should I should add something to the tool. <laughs> so I have a paper on um, RichmondFed.org. If you go to community development, you go to community practice papers. Um, there's a fairly elaborate uh, case study of East Baltimore, um, and the TIF and New Markets Tax credits figure very prominently. And that is a long paper that is detailing a lot of financial transactions. Um, but I can certainly um, whittle that down um, to something that should be usable on homegrown tools. It's on my to-do list. I just haven't done it. <laughs> we look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> Hold me to it. <laughs> Making a note. <laughs> uh, one more question. Do you partner with state organizations that are engaged in community development? Uh, for example, Main Street and state economic development and other types of organizations. Uh, these often work with local partners that have good examples. Yes, um, we have some strong partnerships in North Carolina specifically with those types of entities, but I think where we would love to develop further partnerships um, is with other states, agencies um, of that nature, again, to, to be able to broaden the, the geography that's represented in the, the database. Awesome. I believe those are all of the questions and we've covered everything. So. Do you guys have anything else that you wanted to share as far as closing remarks? Um, I, I would just say that um, thanks EDA for hosting the webinar and for um, funding us and allowing us to do this work. Um, and this is really a beginning of contact that we hope to have with the, the folks that haven't used the tool before. Um, as Carolyn pointed out, we're really looking to develop new partnerships to get new content, and so we'll be following up with everyone uh, who provided your contact information um, immediately and throughout this summer with templates and other ways um, to really get everyone engaged uh, in helping us build out this tool. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that, I mean, I will say that um, the, as, working in a small town, you don't have a whole lot of extra time and energy to expend on anything besides your town. But I really felt like um, the updating our case study it was very easy. I mean, it didn't take up a whole lot of my time. It wasn't hard. It wasn't intense. And and so I think that if you are able to offer some information and help build out this case study, if you even can just carve out a little bit of time to do that, um, just to make this a, a better and more useful tool, I would encourage you to do it. But I would just say uh, thank you to all the, the webinar participants for your great questions. Um, you've given us a lot of things to, to think about as we move forward with this project. Um, and, you know, most of us around the table have strong North Carolina focus, and it's nice to hear from folks outside the state about the ways this tool can be useful. And I think uh, that's really helpful for us. All right. Well, Thank you everyone for joining. I know this was a lot of information. 
to digest and we're really uh, thankful for your engagement and suggestions as well. So um, follow up. I think all the contact information is on the slide at the end. So please follow up if you have any questions and um, we look forward to working with you in the future. Mm -hmm. Thanks all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Yep.